In this episode, I talk with Zainab Yate. Zainab is a biomedical ethicist with a specialist interest in infant feeding. Zainab is vice chair and named qualitative lead on a paediatric flagged research ethics committee panel for the Health Research Authority in the UK. She's also been a volunteer breastfeeding peer supporter with the NHS for a number of years, is the owner, author of the resource site for mothers and healthcare practitioners on breastfeeding or nursing, aversion and agitation, and the author of When Breastfeeding Sucks. In this episode, I get to chat with Zainab about what is breastfeeding aversion and agitation and what is DMER, dysphoric milk ejection reflex. And we talk about what the differences are between the two. What do clinicians need to look for specifically? Why does DMER or breastfeeding aversion actually occur? How many women does it occur in? How long does it last? And what can be done to support women experience this? We talked about what being touched out actually means and how to deal with it. And we took a dive into when the euphoria does not happen immediately after birth. This is an incredible episode with so many golden nuggets and thoughtful insights. So what are you waiting for? Get the kettle on, put the leash on the dog and get your runners on because you're in for a treat. I'm Katie James, and this is the Midwives' Cauldron podcast. Each episode, I'm joined by my incredible co-host, Dr. Rachel Reed. Listen in as we hubble, bubble, toil and trouble our way through aspects of womanhood, midwifery, birth and lactation. So go on, subscribe now, and hear us on your favorite podcast host. But just a sec, before we start on this epic episode, if you love the show and want more from Rachel and me, then head on over to our websites and check out all the courses, books, collectives a go-go. You'll find all the details and occasional discount deals on the old Instagram at The Midwives Cauldron or, of course, in the show notes below. And if you really, really love the show, Please consider two things, a single or a monthly donation over on Patreon or even buy me a coffee. And remember that review you leave on your podcast host really makes a difference in who listens in. Thank you for your support. We just love having you bubbling away with us. Zainab Yate, welcome to the cauldron. I am very excited to have you here with me today. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, You are not as excited as I am, if you can't tell. The the (laughs) Midwives Cauldron has been a huge part of my life for the last like few years with my my recent my recent newborn. So really I just have hats off and thank you. I'm very honoured to be invited from the bottom of my heart uh, to talk about this, really. Oh, that's so lush. Oh, thank you. I think we're both oh, excited then. And no, of course, I was really excited. <laughs> <laughs> that's always lovely. Thank you. Um, Rachel sends her apologies because obviously we are not recording at a time when Rachel should be awake or is awake. That mm-hmm. is definite for Brisbane because Zainab is in the UK. Um, so that's not really working out. But. No. Zainab is the author of Why Breastfeeding Sucks, and this is a book which, and a topic which I really don't think we have out there as a common theme, and in terms of breastfeeding aversion or something known as dysphoric milk ejection reflex, or a nice short version, DMER, not so short. And that is why I have bought Zainab into the cauldron because she is the person that I really want to just get some good information out there so that we can have a grounding in what's going on, where are there being misdiagnoses, and what we can do about it and how we can move forward because this is quite a big topic. So I suppose what I want to ask you is 
Can we walk through what is breastfeeding aversion or dysphoric milk ejection for our audience? Yeah, definitely. I think um, so. In my research, I've I've now sort of ended up grouping it under breastfeeding triggering negative emotions and then looking at the nuances for when that can happen and why it can happen and what we know. And of course, which is a lot in women's health, what we don't. Mm. And basically, aversion is something that's, I believe, been around since, I guess, the dawn of human time. And I also believe that whilst it's been around, even though it may have been uncommon, I think as the years have progressed and particularly into our recent history of recent times, it's uh, on the increase and I can go into why later. Mm. But aversion is essentially when breastfeeding triggers particular negative emotions and intrusive thoughts. And they're all when the infant is latched. So it occurs during the breastfeed, whether it's 10 seconds or, you know, two hours, like the the bedtime boobathon. Mm -hmm. And they can in mainly include things like anger, rage, uh, irritation, and disgust, um, intrusive thoughts like wanting to delatch, wanting to push the infant off, uh, throw them across the room is another intrusive thought mm. that's very, very common, um, which can alarm mums. Yeah. And essentially, once infants are latched, it can start and the onset is varying. It could be from when you have a newborn to... Um, to onset when your your wee baby is becoming a toddler so the onset varies the duration varies so some mums will get it uh just you know once or twice a month maybe with their post menses uh, post partum menses returning uh, others will have it all the time so that's a version that's essentially a really I complex think. one when it's there's no predictability to it um, whilst there's no predictability, there are what I call loosely risk factors. So not in a very medical or clinical sense, because we don't have the literature to back that up. Mm. However, we do have groups that are experiencing aversion more common, uh, commonly. So you can have, for example, it's quite commonly well known in the tandem community to have aversion. It's commonly well known, um, particularly now, more so with all of the data around tongue tie oral restrictions and difficulties feeding around um, oral restrictions because of the, well, you know, the extreme pain, mm. the complications that come with it. Sometimes you're triple feeding, uh, you know, you're trying to express your bottle feeding and your breastfeeding. Um, so that that's a common time for aversion to arise. When's another one? Like I said, menses, mm -hmm. uh, return of the postpartum menses can often bring that about and that makes a lot of sense to me hormonally because of women that unfortunately can experience those negative uh, emotions around menses anyway mm. uh, it just it, it was such a sensitive area they can be amplified you know some women have yeah. a higher sensitivity around that area so and all of those things it feels like apart from the the hormonal side of it which makes total sense what you're saying like you're just going to feel everything much more but if you've got kind of like a tongue tie or an oral restriction you're probably mm. going to have a baby who's not fully draining the breast so then they might be going back to the breast even more frequently so you've got more frequent feeding exactly. with more pain is increasing and then you exactly. mentioned the tandem feeding and I just want to clarify that for anyone who doesn't know what tandem feeding is so that's breastfeeding a baby that you maybe your toddler and you're breastfeeding your new baby. So you might be breastfeeding your child and your new baby. And again, there's a lot of action mm. going on the nipple breast area. So it, that's, that's exactly spot on. So for some women, it is literally, um, I think, I don't think it's a third of my book, but it's a lot of my book talking about um, being touched out. So what touched out is, and um, the concept of skinship and how touch and skinship and relationships and everything go hand in hand. So some people are touchy feely. You may have come across those in your life and you may be a person who does not like it. So imagine that you're not a touchy feely person, but your babies necessarily are, your toddlers necessarily are, they necessarily are that uh, in order to survive. 
So you have something you probably didn't think about, the, the clash of uh, preferences and needs. Um, so they have a need that's a very deep, uh, intrinsic you know, need, and you have a preference which you've grown to for whatever reason. And actually another group I did want to mention that it's common in is those who are survivors of uh, sexual abuse. So you have the whole uh, thing around the touch sensitivity and that area. So again, it can make a lot of sense in that group. That's what I mean by it not being necessarily a risk factor because some women don't experience it. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely makes sense that in that group it's common. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Totally. Hmm. Yeah, this is really complex. And then so then if we talk about DMER and what's the difference? Because I think even if we have a little bit of knowledge going on that there is this kind of aversion, there is this kind of feeling that women can get of, I'm not enjoying this, I don't like this, to the mm. extremes of, yes, I want to throw the baby across the room. But this is in these very short time windows. Um, and trying to place that in the whole scheme of things, I think what happens when when anyone does find information is it feels like it's just the DEMA, the dysphoric milk ejection reflex that they will come across if it's mostly articles, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. But that I think that's primarily because Heiss actually, um, is it Alia Heiss? So I, I can't remember how to say her name. But she's She was 10 years ahead of me in publishing this research. And I think uh, from what I've read uh, in terms of her personal struggle and blog, blog, she was very much in the same position as I was in the sense that she struggled. She looked for answers and there were none. So yeah. she had to do the work. Um and so being a, a, almost a decade ahead means it's it's actually it trickled down, so to speak, to not not the majority of the population, but enough to be able to learn about it. Um, but that's also partly why I did the work, because I realized I didn't have DEMA. It's very, very distinct. And um, even women that have experienced or have both can very uh, much identify which and when occur when they have DEMA, when they have aversion and why. And so for me, that's another clear message that they're distinct. Another thing is that the literature, literature has progressed quite far enough to, I, I guess, categorize it as a, a medical condition mm. um, because of, I mean, there was a recent paper a couple of years ago on its prevalence and also um, on its distinction from uh, other conditions. So I, I myself would categorize uh, DEMA as a condition, uh, whereas okay. aversion, I think, is a phenomena, is an occurrence that happens um, for multiple different reasons, and it's a biopsychosocial uh, phenomena. So, and I think it's a very important phenomena that can teach us a lot. So in the sense that the clear, distinct differences are that DEMA occurs at the very beginning of a feed because it's actually linked to the milk ejection reflex. So we have the um, first few minutes of a feed and sometimes a bit more than that, depending on how many multiple reflex uh, milk ejection reflexes women have, because it can vary. Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing that you can, from the get-go, uh, know the difference of, because with aversion, it's just there. Okay. Unless the, the baby is delatched, it's just there the whole time through for, for almost everyone. The second thing is the nature of the um, negative emotions. So you can have, you know, 40 different emotions on this side of what could be considered negative without any moral considerations. I'm not talking about whether they're right or wrong mm -hmm. or anything. I'm just saying they're considered negative. Dima has ones that are, they're very characteristic of more uh, dysphoric in nature. So you're talking about this bottomless pit of your tummy, this hopelessness, this emptiness, this despair, this uh, wave of dysphoria, this lowness. It's um, it's very different. This sadness, this it's it's incredibly hard for them um, mm -hmm. because it comes in a wave. Um, but it's it's not the same as maternal type aggression. It's not the same as anger and rage. Uh, irritability is something that crosses over with both of them, but certainly the emotions are different as well. So you have how long it lasts, the duration. You have the characteristic symptoms or emotions that come. And then I cannot believe I might forget the last one. 
<laughs> oh wow well, yeah, that's why so you write a book so yeah. you can dip in that's what Rachel does and lots of our guests they'd go hold on we need to just get the book out is that allowed that is that's not allowed totally is allowed really? oh my god yeah the <laughs> magic of editing and sometimes I don't because it's uh, real life no well no I shouldn't I think um well, basically that there is a huge difference also in the sense that we know why the dysphoria occurs and we you know we know that's linked to the milk ejection reflex and we know that it's at the beginning of a feed whereas with aversion you've got so many multiple factors um and I'm sure as researchers take this on they're going to show that but with dysphoric milk ejection reflex you've got two possible theories and it's one linked to dopamine and prolactin because of the interplay that happens around that in a woman's body when the milk ejection reflex kicks in so there's a dip in dopamine basically when prolactin increases and you have the other which is more recent from Kathy Kendall Tackett uh, and Moberg which is an uh, uh, amazing insight and I would probably err on that side in terms of the negative pairing of oxytocin mm. uh, so the the body sort of miss pairing it in a sense and it's up regulating a stress response yeah um, so though for those reasons uh, you can you can distinctly I mean taking any clinical assessment just by asking the mother how what do you feel when you're breastfeeding how do you feel can you describe it you can know within a few uh, minutes a, a couple of responses you can be able to click uh, it's it's DEMA or it's um, aversion and where to go from there yeah absolutely oh that's a lovely really clear ex exclamation ex Exclamation. Explanation. Get it right. Get it right. Oh my God, God. What's going on? It's in the evening. See, I always record late in the evening or yeah. early in the morning. I, I was talking to Rachel the other day and we said, uh, can you imagine if both of us actually recorded in a time when we had our heads switched on? Wow, it'd be even it'd be amazing. There would be magic. There would it be would. flow. It would. It would It'd probably be, be very dull. Because <laughs> we wouldn't make all these mistakes and I wouldn't leave them in. Um, no, that's really clear. And I think uh, for me, how I found it is it seemed to have sat within the kind of qualified IBCLC lactation consultant world and hasn't dripped down to the midwives or the maternal child health nurses or health visitors, whatever country you're in. Those kind of the bread and butter of the supporters who are looking after the woman, uh, the breastfeeding dyad in those early postpartum days, weeks, months, or following them long term in that early childhood. And this should be part of the general training that we're doing for midwives, for health visitors, because this is like you say, it's quite easy to diagnose. However, it's being misdiagnosed often as postpartum depression, or we're picking up on a few key words, but not necessarily the time frame, or that it's lasting just during breastfeeding. And then actually when the breastfeed finishes, the mother's saying, I actually feel completely different and I feel yeah. like I can get on with my life and <laughs> it's just occurring okay. this. I feel, yeah, okay. Maybe not wonderful, but maybe okay. Uh -huh. Um. Yeah. So for me, it was hard to um, to really push the work out out there in a in a healthcare professional sense. I have been asked to talk uh, a few times to different groups like midwives and health visitors, uh, particularly health visitors. But, and, and I think primarily because it's not actually we don't know in terms of aversion what the prevalence is. So in DEMA, we know that there's a piece of work done um, with prevalence data and it's 9.1 was the number that was given. So it, it's not low, no. um, that occurs. And with DEMA, it can occur from birth as well. So, and because it's a hormonal or, or linked to the possible play interplay of, of these two sets of hormones, and then it would be important to include it in the curriculum because you could be assessing a, a mother from the get go. Um, with aversion, we don't we don't actually know how many women will get it from the get go. And mm. from what I've seen over the last ten years, it's it's really not as many 
um, as those who experience it later on for different reasons, um, for the reasons that I gave. Mm. Uh, so to ha- changes in hormones after the postpartum menses. Um, with sexual abuse, we know that all the literature uh, shows that actually um, breastfeeding helps those dyads. It helps that mother um, and it can heal her in a sense. And actually a high percentage, I don't know, it's 81% or 91% of those mothers want to breastfeed and so should be supported to breastfeed. Um, but it's when it's later on that I see the aversion kicking in. And again, in a, in a sort of commonsensical way, that makes sense. You know, when the toddler can get more boisterous, uh, mm. is stronger, Demanding. is clambering at your breasts, is, you know, a waking up and you could say attacking you <laughs> at night. Mm. Uh, you can get have a full-on panic attack right Mm. you know this could be really triggering so it's hard because healthcare professionals um in England I know and in many places in the world are so swamped they're just so 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 swamped I mean it's so good to have these things on your radar um hopefully they'll be included in the curriculum in a in a way that's kind to midwives and doctors and healthcare professionals so I, I, you know, I do think it's important, but we just don't know how many people are affected earlier on. So unless you're seeing them later on, aversion may not be as apparent. However, saying that, my main thing that I want to have anyone listening take away is that negative emotions, whether they're edema or aversion, are such an important sign. So S-I-G-N. They are, I think, an important medical clinical sign Uh, on one level they are completely because you can use it as part of your clinical assessment and you can use it as part of a differential diagnosis Um, but they're also just an important sign for the mother as well on a personal level because it's telling you something so whatever the negative emotions you're getting you you need to listen to them after you can process them because they're talking it's talking to you first and foremost it means something like it means something go go delve deeper (laughs) find out go get help, go talk to someone, even if it's a friend to begin with. Uh, Don't be like me. It took me a year to say anything, even to my, the love of my life. I didn't say anything to anyone. I Mm. thought it was, I thought I was mad. Why would you tell someone you're feeling this? It's just absurd. Yes. You know, but. And uh, the fear that comes with kind of opening up to some of the thoughts and feelings, which can be quite bizarre. Yeah. um, And unless you're in the community. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I mean, we're surrounded. And if we take the average woman who's giving birth, she is surrounded by the beauty of social media. There has been a growth oh, in the last yeah. few years of, you know, the realities of motherhood. But I still think there's a lot of bullshit to it. And oh, there is still this kind of competitive way that we have to make sure that we're on form and we're doing X, Y, Z. And even with our closest people in our lives, Mm. do we ever have those moments where we tell our darkest deepest secrets and Mm. when this is happening over and over and when it's with your baby or Mm. your child Mm. I can only imagine that this feels even more potentially dangerous Mm. to open up and discuss Mm. and yet it's what you need to do is like to be able to talk to somebody that is the very first very very important step it's it's Oh, it's it's just so important if there's anyone you can disclose it to. So basically, non-disclosure is a huge issue in this community because um, those that understand services like in England, we have social services, children's services, um, you know, misrepresenting what they're saying as something that they take action on. Yeah. like women who have severe postpartum depression or um, even psychosis and things like that are not going to disclose. The non-disclosure is, in, you know, something that happens a lot um, because of that reason, the fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whether it's to a partner or a friend or whether it's to healthcare professionals, is it seems quite high, unfortunately. Uh, and then you have those that do disclose, uh, and there are many, to their GP, what we call a general practitioner in the UK, your local doctor, uh, they're basically just, it, it's sort of, I don't want to sound um, sexist in a way, but it, it seems like this very male logic. It's like, oh, negative emotions plus baby equals postpartum depression. It was like, no, mm-hmm. no, no, no. I'm not telling you I'm depressed. I'm, you know, generally 
a happy I want to I'm up for life but yeah. when they latch I want to stab someone this yeah. is something that I need yeah. looking at um <laughs> is yeah. this normal have you heard of it because please tell me oh, you have because yeah. I feel really on yeah. my own and there's just the postpartum depression label and here's some medication maybe maybe there's here's some CBT some cognitive behavioral therapy or some I will um, refer you to the psychologist one would hope but of um I think from almost everyone who's complaining to me about it, it's uh, it's basically on SSRIs straight away. And mm-hmm. I have a real issue with that because uh, uh, pharmacology has side effects and uh, you should not be prescribing to people that don't need it at all. Yeah, um, and it's just not an informed choice and it's not responsible. And again, I sympathize with GPs. I do. They have less than 10 minutes in the UK to yeah. see people. They have Ridiculous. a million gazillion things to go through. So I do. Uh, but that's the gripe that I find. Non-disclosure and disclosure. It's like two double-edged sword. Which one do you go down? Yeah. <laughs> do you take the lottery? Which one are you gonna... Yeah. Yeah. Who it, maybe it's more about thinking who you disclose to. And I wanna I wanna come down this thing, this line of talk of, you know, where should women go and what should they be doing? Mm. But um I just is there any like is there any way of predicting it? Like do women, uh, are women who maybe have experienced it with a first pregnancy and they're pregnant again, are they more likely to experience DEMA or breastfeeding aversion? Well, DEMA we know in the literature, we we know uh, that it can be um, a risk factor is basically having it once. And so, yeah. And yeah. again, that makes sense in the model of what dysphoric milk rejection reflex is and the mechanisms by which it occurs. So it would make sense unless your body's drastically changing its hormonal interplay, uh, you're going to be um, experiencing a, again. It, the severity, however, the, the understanding of that is not as clear. So some women only get it for six to eight weeks. Um, so that, again, that might be the change in how the milk ejection reflex uh, not works because we know how it works already but maybe the uh, intensity by which the feelings are experienced lessens because you know your milk supply is somewhat established by six weeks basically mm. um, there's so many questions uh, that's the problem isn't it with this field really yeah it's, it's an open yeah, box need, of questions rather and you than... don't want to posit too much because um, you don't want to give that the wrong information but it is also fascinating so so I used to get for every year, hundreds of women would be like, yeah, I know I'm ovulating and I get so I get a version when I'm ovulating. And yeah. I'd be like, oh, what were you talking about? What? So um, but it actually makes complete sense because a lot of women, um, not everyone um, it notices this, but um, many women get a, a, sp- a spike in testosterone that does affect them just when they're ovulating. And, you know, that makes sense biologically because you're going you're on heat. You want to have sex and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, but then testosterone is like literally the aggressive hormone. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the one that makes you like, Rrr. that makes total sense. So you'd get a version, you know, why don't we know this? It's biology 101. Teach it to girls in school. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I... it would help their mates out when they get pregnant. <laughs> I think it would help us out like every once a month, like every yeah. day of the school year. Can you, yeah. can you imagine going <laughs> back to school now with that many of us? And if oh. we had knowledge, I mean, that's always the answer, isn't it? It's always about knowledge. But I do love mm. that you so beautifully said that, you know, it would be nice for us to have this information, but there is a huge amount of time poor and resource poor um, yeah. health practitioners out there and also to be giving this information when we're giving it is to be with kindness and mm. it's not always easy to take on board and I suppose that's why I sit here and do the podcast because oh, I, it can raise that it, you're the bridge you're the bridge <laughs> for some things that's the plan that's the hope yeah no 100 percent. so I think the hugely important part that some some one like you plays something like the the midwife's cauldron plays and what what was a main driver for my research and my work was the fact that you give the women the words they need to use to say what is going on do you know you give them the words here here are the words and then other people understand those words so I'm telling you that if you were to present as a healthcare professional to a healthcare professional and you were to say hi you know what I'm experiencing 
breastfeeding as triggering particular negative emotions that don't occur outside of when I feed what what's going on because I'm actually otherwise okay so is there something I can do you know and then if they ask more questions you can say well I would consider them intrusive thoughts that I'm not acting on but I think this this and this I also get very angry and agitated or I have feelings of dysphoria but I'm I'm no there's no suicidal ideation I just have feelings of hopelessness and despair only when they're lacked so you give them these words and they're very sort of succinct and they make a lot of sense and to a healthcare professional it's like oh ding 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 hang on a second this is not postpartum depression ding 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 ding. you know what I mean and then yeah that's what you I remember after I, I listened to the gestational diabetes uh, mother and baby podcast that you did I was just so empowered I could go to my house I was like no yes no yes no I was just <laughs> reeling it off and that's what you've just done that is so brilliant that was like just putting everything out there that's exactly it you've just put the words into whoever's out there and thinking oh my god they're yeah. talking about me uh, yeah this is the yeah. first time I've heard this Thank God someone's talking about me and I've been wanting to do this discussion for so long because I feel that there are far too many new mothers, experienced mothers who are out there. They might even be on their second or third baby and Mm. just biting their teeth all the way through thinking they're completely crazy. Mm-hmm. and toe curling they're not toe curling sensations mm. no you're not crazy no you're not and as healthcare professionals if you're listening to this no you're not crazy for not knowing about this okay yes. just all of you are not crazy it's it's something that's happening we know more and more about it every year we will begin to know more and more about it um in a medical sense as well so i i i don't want to be all doom and gloom but i do think it will be on the rise and I have a lot of reasons to uh, posit that, basically, mm-hmm. because one reason why negative emotions can arise is well known in social theory is when expectation doesn't meet reality. And uh, we're literally talking about the whole idea of social media and we are just swamped with it. You know, we're saturated with it. And whether you like it or not, it's affecting you. So new mums in particular you will be having an expectation that will definitely not be met in your reality because the reality is just very tough. There's no social media page that you could follow that will give you the reality of what it is to become a new mum. So if you're going to be getting negative emotions, and this is negative emotions outside of the three-day baby blues, this is negative emotions outside of the 10 characteristic symptoms of post uh, postpartum depression. So depression has very, they have very specific, I can't it's not specific and it's not general but there are a cluster of 10 symptoms that if you meet a a good number of them you are more likely depressed and that encompasses a lot more things than just negative emotions so that will encompass weight loss and weight gain that will encompass having a lack of um, interest in anything like you know it's got in life basically that will encompass um sleep problems and that's another difficulty in this area because obviously you're going to have state changes in sleep Mm -hmm. but basically negative emotions I think are are going to arise more in moms because of where we sit in the 21st century um, which is which I guess is is important to know because as healthcare professionals you might see it cropping up and as moms like you said if they're on their fourth baby and they've not had a version before and it crops up, uh, we have reasons, you know, that that might happen. Mm, yeah, it's a, it's kind of like a terrifying reality that we're in, but we're in the rabbit hole with it. Yeah, it's how I feel. I mean, it's a big topic to go down. It's a whole nother podcast in, in one way, but it's it it is the the social construct of how we currently are and how we live our lives and what we're bombarded with, whether we're actually a conscious of it or not and that is you know once you become pregnant it's massively ramped up in every way and yeah I mean it's like you know the planning of the wedding that goes on for a year and and everything and every single details down to the last you know nuance and then it's not as great as you wanted which is really bloody horrible when it comes to having a baby it's 
it's hugely challenging on so many forms and also can be hugely elating and wonderful and a, an incredible experience for mm. people. But I think we don't talk about the potential realities, the fact that, you know, a mother can birth her baby and not have this instant, you know, overflowing golden juicy deliciousness of oxytocin Mm -hmm. now is this the medicalization of birth is this Mm -hmm. what we're putting women through that we're not then connecting with the hormones and Mm -hmm. that we haven't gone through this kind of physiological birthing process or is it just a natural phenomena for some women in how they are made up and it takes longer for them to feel those kind of rushes or Mm -hmm bonding and connection also have they got other things in the back in the history in the trunk on the back I mean Kathleen Kendall Tackett you mentioned her we had her on the Mm -hmm. podcast she talks extensively in this kind of area and that's why she's always fascinated me her work as well I think what you said is so interesting um, in general as a research question and I'm sure it will be explored i personally find it extremely on point with my first I had the cascade of interventions and frankly the complete bullshit that goes along with it Mm -hmm. Uh, looking back at it now I needed none of that there was just a bunch of negligence and all that Mm -hmm. that ended up in a what was supposedly in adverted commas an emergency c-section which I later found out was just due to staff change um, which is very common here Yeah. yeah so did I get the bonding then no could afterwards after debriefing and rationalizing it could I understand why yes the second birth fought for a home birth uh went under the home birth team wonderful 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 uh waters break at home uh had light meconium uh was basically pushed sort of to go in um and you know two hours of pushing and she was there I I have had a lot of medication in my life. I've had a lot of orthopedic surgery. I had polio from a vaccination as a child. And I've had, yeah, like I've had multiple surgeries and a lot of morphine and codeine and other (laughs) strong drugs. But I'm laughing audience because of Zainab's (laughs) face, the way she said that. So sorry. (laughs) No, I'm only bringing it up because the euphoria I felt after giving birth um, to my second is nothing compared to any of that drugs I mean uh, yeah I wouldn't say it's worth it but it was amazing and I think back at it now I was euphoric I was on a high uh, you know that was the oxytocin rush that they spoke about fast forward to the third one uh for all wants and purposes I basically had a free birth I was unassisted uh, I basically stayed away from everyone that I possibly could so I only had one scan and that was it I refused everything else Uh, Mm. I was informed I did a lot of research I'm talking about months of research and uh, I free birthed at home and I had uh, neither so not the bonding um, but not in a bad way like I didn't feel that love and all that stuff but not in a bad way and I didn't have the oxytocin rush Wow. So weird. So I'm all wow. the same person, right? My body's all the same. And you would have thought with the empowered, autonomous choice of, you know, birthing, that you would you would have uh, the, the best of it, right? Yeah. Um, and then you yeah. would have thought with the sabotaging and going into hospital that you wouldn't have the euphoria of the oxytocin afterwards. Um, but no. So every birth um, was, yeah, not textbook in a sense, but it's interesting because what came out at the time wouldn't you you wouldn't think consequentially would be yeah would be what would happen absolutely wow and everyone's That's... different but I I really love that you've shared that with us thank you I think it's really important and fascinating and also makes me have more questions like for research that either I haven't read or mm. that needs to be done and just like it makes me wonder about in terms of like Dima, if that would be different with different partners or if you had Mm. um, because of the genetic material that's in the baby and whether that does anything as well, Mm. because the experience of the type of 
pregnancy, the type of birth, and can be different with a different partner. However, that could be uh, biopsychosocial, but Mm -hmm. that could also be it's your second baby, perhaps it was quicker, easier, Mm -hmm. you were more informed. It's really difficult to extrapolate these, but my brain's just kind of going around that that oh, no. I mean, um, they know in terms of lactation, what uh, physiology happens, what physiological changes happen mm-hmm. literally in the breast. You have yeah. more breast tissue, you change your, you, so there are things that your body remembers and there yes, are things the, that your like body does better. Like the memory breast and, cells. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So it would, um, it would just be so fascinating to know if, you know, if the world gave a shit about women, we would have more research, Wouldn't nuanced research just... in it. Yeah, it would be an incredible. Um, it would be incredible for us to be able to have some sort of answers and also to uh, tick off our intuitions, you know, because yeah. we're very intuitive women. Um, uh, women do have these intuitions as to reasons why things happen. And I think we should honor that because uh, I don't ever say like, no, that that can't be the case or no. Uh, so for example something that women are often told is is no no that's not the case um, or had been for the last 40 years is that when they have their menses return whether it's at three weeks six weeks six months or two years is that they notice a dip in their supply uh, and they will say like I just know there's uh, it's either lower supply for a short period of time or it's just gone lower Um, and they've been told no no that doesn't happen it just doesn't affect you it does it does yes. and it just we have to honor what they say and I totally agree seen it in my clients and with friends as well like mm. absolutely it's like it would always be one of those questions when they're like ah I'm freaking out my milk's it's like mm. are you showing signs of ovulation have you just yeah. had your period come back are you bleeding yeah. uh-huh okay And I love what you say about the intuition. I think um, that also can be helpful in this situation in terms of believe that what you're feeling and seeing, Hmm. if it feels wrong, if it feels awkward, if it feels really difficult, then find, it's a bit like we say to midwives, find the person who's going to kind of hold that space for you and yeah. feels like a safe support person. Yeah. Choose the right person. We all have yeah. friendship groups where we'll tell one thing to someone, yeah. but not to the other person. Choose your person wisely because they're going to probably give you the support you need. However, it's it's seen as, huh, that's... Uh, oh, that's really sad that you're experiencing this. And then they're a bit flummoxed of going, what do I do? Should we send you to the doctor? Should we, Mm -hmm. should you tell your health visitor? You know, what, what's available for women or friends of women or even health professionals when they're in this predicament going, okay, something's up here. I don't know where to go. I don't Mm -hmm. even know what to suggest to how this mother can cope. I think it's something that's happening more and more. Uh, so I would, ha- I'll happily recommend it. Um, and it's not to, you know, blow my own trumpet or anything. But if there's any literature, for example, the first paper published on a version, uh, which is mine, it's open source. And there are a couple now, uh, more so, uh, describing the phenomena. And uh, Dima, like I mentioned, there's one, if it's not open source, the summary is, which uh, clearly states the prevalence and the feelings that occur print it off link to it take the show notes yeah so print print it off literally print it off have it in front of you um if you're willing to talk to a friend take it if you're willing to talk to your partner and open up take it if you're lucky enough to have the confidence to go to a healthcare professional take it and this is seen as um you know uh, evidence-based literature and actually once you do that for any good healthcare professional, you should spike their interest. So they would find out what to do next. Um, you know, anyone who went into caring for others in, in medicine or midwifery, uh, they did it for a reason and they're probably going to, their heart's going to want to know, you know, what is this? I haven't heard of this. So taking the literature, printed off literature with you uh, would be something that's both empowering uh, for anyone that's sitting there, you and the healthcare professional. Um, and then, Actually, a, a good one 
also would be to print off my differential diagnosis um, piece, which is in a public health breastfeeding book that a good friend of mine, Alison Spiro, has just published with, I don't know who it is, Oxford Union, some very prestigious press. And so there's a lot of clout with that. There's, yes. You could take that and whack someone over the head with it. You know, <laughs> this occurs. Um, so the differential diagnosis piece is something that you can print off as a couple of pages and it can be empowering again for both the mum and the healthcare professionals to understand what the next steps are. Because if you can identify from the get go, like that screening, that there's no way it's postpartum depression, then you shouldn't be making a referral to, um, you know, a doctor for that or a psychiatrist, you know, someone that's going to prescribe for that. Um, and we're only at the stage now, unfortunately, to have very localized uh, information on what can help and that's that's probably the hardest thing for me to say so if you want to find out what's going to help with DEMA you're going to have to go to someone who's a well um, well learned IBCLC with a fair bit of practice supporting um, women with DEMA and also get yourself on with the the literature the, the literature that HICE has produced because actually it's quite nuanced and I say that in in the sense that I don't want you to do trial and error to figure out what works but it has been that something that can work for someone does not work for someone else and mm. uh let, let's just give an example caffeine uh so dark chocolate with a high amount of caffeine or, or even a caffeinated drink like coke a highly caffeinated sugary drink at the time of breastfeeding can combat the emotions the dysphoric emotions and again that sort of makes sense um but for a group of women who experience it, but there mm. are just as many uh, women who don't find it helps at all. Yeah. Uh, so, and then there are also particular um, uh, herbal supplements and in some cases, uh, some prescribed medicines. Now, I do want to put the caveat on that actually some women um, have experienced a lessening of negative emotions when they are on SSRI so it's not all doom and gloom mm. but again you can see how that might make sense as well uh, because they are you know serotonin they they change things for you so it might be that it works for you so there are possible avenues to look at some of them are non-intervention based some of them are uh, pharmacological based a lot of them that I would suggest are diet lifestyle and like mindset based because of how I understand, for example, aversion to be in terms of the biopsychosocial phenomena. So if I give you a direct, <laughs> very personal, but direct way to combat this, I had aversion with both children. Everybody knows that I had it very severely. Um, both of those children had posterior tongue ties. The first was missed, second was snipped. And it was just, let me just say that I hated breastfeeding every single feed. I could count on one hand mm. the number of times that I thought it was okay and that it wasn't very uncomfortable, icky, uh, borderline painful. Mm. Um, and also, I'm a very busy, 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 busy person, or at least I was. Wrote the book, had my third. My third doesn't have tongue tie. I stopped everything. Uh, I stopped everything so that I didn't get a version and I don't have it and I'm now nearing a year in I've wow. not experienced one session of a version and this is with nearly how many years <laughs> how many years of breastfeeding where I had a version every single feed so so and that was not pharmacological uh, that was that was a drastic change in terms of who I was to who I am it was a drastic change yeah. but it was done in little pockets yeah which is the best yeah. way to go about those things mm -hmm. to be honest as we all know, but we don't always tackle it no. that way. <laughs> to be gentle on yourself. We want it to happen now and be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's just... Holy Blame holy. Amazon Prime. We want it yesterday. I ordered it today. Why didn't it arrive yesterday? <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> it is ridiculous. It's not like that where I live. I have to wait and they should close the shops at 4pm mm. on a Saturday still and oh, everything's gosh, shut on a Sunday. You. Really? Yeah. It, you can breathe, basically, then. Yeah. You it's can breathe. Just, I mean, I'm in Switzerland. People want to go into the mountains and in nature. And 
so they do it and they don't want anyone to be forced to work and they bring it up every so often and they go nope we're not changing it oh yeah they're not going to change i spent a lot of time in geneva and zurich i don't think i remember sundays there though but not much yeah you've got to you've really got to go out it is slightly annoying when you just you're doing diy or summer in the garden and you're like it's a day off i just want (laughs) you know the trowel's broken or whatever i need a bit more trellis it's not there so oh god pros and cons some services i would love to be open like big department stores with diy and gardening that's it happy the sunday wonder the (laughs) sunday wonder down no i don't i just want to go for a specific thing get out Jobs are good. And, uh, but, I don't think um, they're going to change it for you. They're not. They're, 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 they're really not. The whole they're absolutely not. <laughs> no. um, but I mean, for you to have continued breastfeeding with that, um, with your first two, and then to even have considered to breastfeed with the third, it just shows in terms of the fact that, or for me looking at that as an outsider, I can imagine many women, if they haven't, found out what the kind of root cause of this is or how Mm. to explain it it would be an automatic I'm just not going to go there I'm not gonna do breastfeeding well I mean don't get me wrong I did try uh, with both of my children my first in particular I tried a lot Um, I wasn't in the lactation or breastfeeding field then it's because of him that I really was thrown into it I did try like many women do um, to move on to a bottle or express um, and for whatever reason, expressing is hard. Yeah. Some women just cannot express or they cannot express much or it's just not comfortable. Or And then, then you have the whole situation of whether the baby takes the bottle. How much are you going to yeah. try to force the baby on the bottle? You know, so did I choose breastfeeding or did was breastfeeding shoved on me? Mm. And also... And Good also, point. you know, biology, right? I'm Maybe I have this sort of intrinsic... Uh, I don't know, push to do it just because it's lactogenesis too. It's what occurs after to pregnancy. And, you know, do I have a choice in it? I don't know. Part of me, like many mums probably wished they could bottle feed or wish they could. Uh, I even on, on occasion, I wished I could formula feed, but I couldn't yeah. bring myself to do it um, because of being in the lactation field so long and knowing what I know. I just I just couldn't do it. Um, but there are so many women that that are breastfeeding as part of their identity, and so many women. So, for example, in the in the survivors community, they need it. They need to be able to to breastfeed to heal, and it's like this this inner yearning um, yeah. that once is fulfilled. And the literature and the scientific literature shows that they're right. It protects their mental health. It protects yeah. women's mental health in general. That's the literature in general if you want to breastfeed and you can breastfeed and you're supported to do so it's actually protective of your mental health um protects you from postnatal depression i think that's really it's it's really good points and i just think it emphasizes really that it can be a very tricky place to navigate Mm. and that's why i wanted you on in terms of highlighting that there there is places to go there is someone to talk about there is a book that you really need to be getting your hands on Mm -hmm. and reading and and also to settle your mind and there is resources out there I mean I do I did create a uh a mnemonic uh, tool that can walk you step by step through and I do have a diagrammatical um graphic on that for healthcare professionals which is sort of a quick reference it's it's literally like step one uh categorize the dyad you know are they tandem are they breastfeeding one uh, baby are they um there was four groups and then then step two it's look at these possible underlying um causes and then step three it's where to refer and what to do next and then step four basically leads to my mnemonic tool which i called um uh, and the acronym is bromphalic which is basically for specifically for aversion that takes you step by step. You can do it with your healthcare professional or you can do it by yourself if you have some support or are able to have insight into when things occur uh, for you. 
So it lo looks at identifying the breastfeeding aversion triggers and then looking at taking remedial action. And then it, it directs you towards looking at your ovulation and menstruation. So that's the BROM. And then the P is basically what you do to prevent it getting worse. So that's preventative. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it, phallic, is quite detailed on how to address different lifestyle changes, including, you know, sleep hygiene, diet, um, mindset, and um, like I said, meeting expectations uh, so that they are more in tune with reality. So that that I think if you're too overwhelmed with the whole theory, and a lot of people can't read uh, read a whole book at the moment you know I really empathize people are busy mums in particular are tired mm -hmm. uh, and to all my neurodivergent people out there I, I get you it's hard I'm working with the publisher to just push for a audio book to make it easier um, so if you have any of those I'm happy to make those graphics and the bromphalic available um, just for you to, to do it dipping out have a reference and you you know there's changes you can make from the get-go. Actually, to be honest, just sometimes knowing that it occurs, whether it's demo or, or aversion, is just this huge ton of weight off you. Yeah. Yes. I'm not crazy. I'm not a mean yeah. witch. I'm not a stupid, like horrible bitch of a mother. I'm not mental. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So now, is there any final points that we have not discussed because I think you've given us a really amazing overview and a really heartfelt um, overview and sharing your story and experiences and also the work that you've done it's been so great I think we didn't touch on an area that actually I've started doing a bit of research on with a, f a friend a colleague uh, Jenny Stiller who's actually a IBCLC who specializes in supporting uh, those with autism spectrum conditions or those are neurodivergent uh, we didn't want to want to use autism spectrum conditions but it's just in the medical literature so we have to but we've we published a paper on sensory sensitivities and so I think I can quite confidently say that one group that um are an at-risk group I could say of getting aversion mm. is actually those who are neurodivergent and have particular sensory sensitivities so it can be something enlightening for those struggling to to link together um, when their baby is latched uh, to when their toddler is such or whatever and what they struggle with and there are very specific things you can do like um, change the nursing environment include movement in the nursing session um, adapt your clothes to prevent skin on skin contact so particular sensory um, disturbances can mm. be very specific to um, a mum or even a, someone who doesn't identify as a mum breastfeeding so that I wanted to highlight it because it's it's new and it's something that allows a very um, what have been for many years an invisible community to be seen a little bit. Uh, we understand that breastfeeding is a massively sensory experience, and some of the some of the top guns in the field of research would wouldn't probably agree with us. Um, but we have enough uh, experience with mums who struggle to know that it's the case and there's some things you can do about it yeah so aversion can occur so one of the massive triggers is sensory and so there's a big link between this this cohort of people yeah and it kind of makes sense going back to the very beginning of what we were talking about in terms of this touched out feeling and yeah excessive feeling and maybe someone who's not a hugger so to speak I'm a hugger I have to remember my boundaries with certain people who I know are absolutely not huggers I've made the mistake once before and I feel the rigidity in their body and go yeah. oh god Katie stop it so it's uh this kind of intertwining is you've painted us a really amazing picture um I think you've made it really clear I think a lot of people are going to get a huge amount out of this interview. And I am so grateful that you came into the cauldron with me. Thank you so much. No, no worries. The pleasure is literally all mine. It's been so nice to talk with you and meet you. And thanks everyone for listening. Like big up to you for taking the time to skill up 
basically you're skilling up and it's so important absolutely thanks Adab. I hope you found a few golden nuggety nuggets in the show today. Please don't press pause, but instead scroll on down on your podcast app. Yep, that's it, down there, and pop a review and maybe a few stars to make our eyes twinkle with glee. For more on breastfeeding and lactation content, head on over to my website where my course is. And for courses and books from Rachel, you can find everything in the links below. So all I got to say now is, see you next time. And I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs>